looking for an answer to their question? Do they really want to know whose wife would be in heaven? Of course not. The Sadducees denied that there was a resurrection. They had no sense of the afterlife, no sense of the eternal kingdom, no sense of the salvation that Jesus had promised. So rather than ask a question in which they were looking for an answer, they were simply trying to trick Jesus. Let's see if we can catch him up. Let's give him an extreme example. Here's this man who was married to this woman. He died, died childless. What happens? All seven of the brothers marry her. Whose wife will she be in heaven? But Jesus says, you're thinking in earthly terms. You have to think in terms of the heavenly kingdom. And he says that we will be like angels. Now, I don't know what the angels look like. We've all seen them with wings and harps and halos. And you kind of figure angels have to have wings. How else would Gabriel have been able to get from heaven down to earth to give Mary the message that she was going to be the mother of Jesus? How would he do that if he didn't have wings? Well, same thing with the harps and the halos and everything. They're all part of our artistic history. But the reality is angels are pure spirits, and that's what we will be in heaven. And that's what Jesus came for, to bring us the message of resurrection, to bring us the message of eternal life. In the Gospel of John, chapter 14, Jesus says, in my Father's house there are many dwelling places, and I'm going ahead to prepare a place for you so that where I am, you also may be. That is the message of resurrection. That is the message of eternal life. Now we look at this first reading in the second book of Maccabees. Here are the seven brothers. They're being challenged by the king. They're being tortured. They're being beaten. And all they have to do is partake of the pork products. What's so bad about having a piece of bacon or some sausage? How about a ham and cheese sandwich while we're at it? That's all we're asking for. In our world today, that seems like no big deal. But for them, it was the obedience to the teachings of God. They knew that the pork products were wrong. They knew that you would not mix meat and dairy products, and they refused to honor the king. But how did they respond to the king? They said, you can do whatever you want to us because our hearts are set on the resurrection. Our hearts are set on eternal life. We know that God has promised us salvation. Amen? That is the message of our first reading, and it carries on into our gospel. And we recognize that every life is a gift from God. We recognize that we are all made in the image and likeness of God. And if you want to find out where that is in the Bible, it's in the book of Genesis, right at the very beginning. Male and female, he created them in his image, and we are made in the image and likeness of God. Every life is sacred. Every life has value. Every life is important to the Lord. And we recognize our call that even in those difficult situations, those challenging situations, we are called to see the face of Christ in one another. This Tuesday, we're going to be having an election, and this election has probably been one of the most difficult in American history. It has probably been one of the ugliest. It is probably one of those, definitely one of those ones that will be looking forward to when all of this stops and we can move on with the important issues in our country. But we look at this idea of somebody running for president, and Archbishop Gomez, the Archbishop of Los Angeles, said the other day, he said, regardless of who was elected president, Christ is the king. Amen. Amen. When we vote on Tuesday, we are going to ask God for guidance so that we select the right candidates for the president and vice president and the other positions that are open. But also here in California, there are various ballot initiatives that we also have to consider. As many of you know, I'm only here for the fall semester. I'm on a sabbatical program studying at the Jesuit School of Theology in Berkeley. I'm studying sacred scripture. I'm studying world religions. I'm getting involved in things here in the parish and here in the community, particularly the St. Vincent de Paul Society here at St. Columba and the Thursday evening Bible study. But I also decided to do something that would stretch myself a little bit as I met the chaplain of San Quentin Prison. He's a Jesuit priest, and for the last month or six weeks, I've been going there quite regularly on a, ba a regular basis, visiting with the inmates, celebrating Mass with them, getting to know them, because this is an important ministry. Amen? There are just about 4,000 men incarcerated at San Quentin. 750 of them are on death row. Those 750 have been condemned to death. And when you go into the death row area, it doesn't say death row. It just says condemned. It actually has that printed on the wall. 
Well, we go and we celebrate Mass with the men who want to join us for Mass, and we go into a room that's the size of a small classroom. In there, there are eight separate cages, about the size of a phone booth. And as we go in and get set up, the staff bring in the inmates one at a time with their hands handcuffed behind their back. They take them into the cage, lock them in the cage, and then they open up a little slot in the front where the man stands with his back to the guards, holds his hands out, and they take the handcuffs off through the little sliding area there, and the man's hands are able to be free during the mass. Now, I was a little unnerved by this. I had been a volunteer at Juvenile Hall for many years, but there's a lot of difference between dealing with teenagers who have just been arrested as opposed to men who have been on death row for 20 or sometimes even 30 years. And I was a little hesitant because I, what have they done? What are their people, what are their lives? Look at what's going on within them. I was very scared, to be honest with you. But what I found were eight men, very deep spiritual men, men who had a love for God, men who had been locked up for a long time but were seeking spirituality. They knew the Bible. We begin each Mass by asking each one of them, who do you want to pray for? And I expected them all to pray for themselves that they would get off death row. But each one of them prayed for another inmate or the mother of another inmate or the uncle of another inmate or somebody else with the idea of recognizing our call to be in prayer for others. When it came time for me to pray, I asked them to pray for my brother Mike who's battling cancer. When we went back the next week, one of the inmates looked at me and he says, how's your brother Mike doing? I thought, how would you possibly remember that? But what this is doing is helping me to affirm in myself my belief that we're all made in the image and likeness of God. Amen? One of the ballot initiatives that's coming up on Tuesday is initiative number 62. And this is a call for the end to the death penalty here in California. Amen. I'm a registered voter in the county of Los Angeles, so I already had to mail in my ballot because I can't vote here on Tuesday because my ID won't match what they're looking for. But I was looking at these propositions, and I looked at the idea of the death penalty. And I looked at it and I said, is that what Christ is calling us to, to, you know, to kill people? It was interesting. We walked by, and there's this big tower, like this pipe, and the chaplain was saying, when they used to have the gas chamber, that's where the gas fumes came out of at that time. Now they're looking at lethal injection. But whatever the method, is that what Christ is calling us to? And that's what we have to answer. Yes, we look at those on death row. They have committed horrible crimes. And this initiative is not going to open the door to just let them go back into society. Each one of them, if this passes, each one of them will receive an automatic life without parole. And it's the idea we want to protect our citizens. We want to make sure that we are protected in our communities. But at the same time, looking at the death penalty, is that what Christ is calling us to? As a former CPA, certified public accountant, I looked at the financial aspects of this. Since the death penalty was reinstituted in California in 1978, the state of California has spent $5 billion, billion with a B, billion dollars on the death row. There have been 13 executions in these 38 years, and it has cost $384 million per execution. Now think about this. What could that money have been used for? Schools, homeless shelters, health care. I mean, we could make a whole list of things. The next area of that that I look at is what happens if someone is wrongly convicted, sent to death row, and executed? Oh, no, that could never happen. No, no. Well, when I was a volunteer at Juvenile Hall, there was a young man named Bruce Lisker who was arrested at 17, charged with killing his mother. Each Sunday, his father was the first one in line to visit his son, and his father said, I know he didn't do this. Bruce Lisker was convicted. He spent 20 years in state prison. Last year, it was determined that the Los Angeles Police Department had falsified evidence. On the front page of the LA Times, Bruce Lisker walked out of jail after 20 years with a settlement from the city of Los Angeles of $7 million. Is it possible somebody innocent could be on death row? It is certainly possible, absolutely. So then you raise the question, well, who is on death row? Come on, if you're in charge with murder, you should be able to hire the best attorney you can. Well, a lot of them don't have the money to hire the best attorneys. They get public defenders and court-appointed attorneys who are doing the best they can and sometimes are excellent attorneys, but they're on a tight budget. 
They can't bring in all the expert witnesses. They can't bring in all the other things. So if you're on death row, you're probably not of the upper economic major uh, major minority. You're probably someone who is there because you couldn't afford the millions of dollars for a proper defense. The last point that I look at is people ask about the racial implications of death row. Now, if you look at death row, it's pretty evenly divided between Caucasians, African Americans, Hispanics, and a few Asians. But the question that I raise is take a look at the race of the victim. That is a huge issue in determining who goes to death row. These are some of the issues that I've been studying over the past couple of months, and that's why I voted yes on 62 to be able to say, let's end the death penalty. Now, there's another initiative, 66, that is the flip side of that coin. What ballot initiative 66 says, let's hurry up the death penalty. Let's get rid of these automatic appeals. Let's just go ahead and execute them and get on with this program. I said, wait a second. Then you're increasing the, re the chance of executing an innocent person. These are the issues we have to look at. This Tuesday, we're going to have an opportunity to have our voices heard by voting. And I heard somebody say, if you don't vote, you don't have any right to complain. And there, amen. Now, each person is invited to vote their conscience, to really vote how they feel that the Lord is calling us to vote. Whether it's for candidates or whether it's initiatives, we are asked to take that to prayer and ask the Lord, Lord, what is the right thing to do in this situation? But we look at the opportunity and responsibility we have to vote. It's an opportunity that we have to have our voices heard, and it's a responsibility of citizens of this country to make sure that our voices are heard. We look at this gospel message, the message of resurrection, the message of eternal life. That's what Jesus has promised us. Jesus has, has told us that every person is made in the image and likeness of God. Jesus reached out to the poor, the marginalized. Jesus did not say us and them. He said we. We are children of God. We are all brothers and sisters in the one true God. So as we continue with our liturgy of the Eucharist this morning, let's take a couple of moments of silent prayer and reflection. And let's ask the Lord to truly help us recognize the value of every human life. Continue to recognize that we are all made in the image and likeness of God. And that our Lord and Savior has promised us a message of resurrection. For as Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever comes to me will never die.